Welcome to Tea Time, the podcast. I am Cassie Marina, fondly known as the Branding Queen, and I am a digital branding expert helping businesses get online and thrive doing so. I am passionate about sharing my knowledge through content creation like this podcast, online classes, and workshops, as well as through the services of my branding agency to help you develop your online systems. Think of this podcast as the place to get the latest advice, strategies, tips, news, and inspiration on building your brand online using the tools available to us, but most importantly, thought-provoking content to improve your mindset, to maximize on these tools, and put context to -to day-to-day developments in the online world of business with a little bit of tea edition facts and sass because I really want you to thrive online. So thank you so much for tuning in. Let's begin. So you're concerned about the investment of creating a website. You either don't have a website and you're on the fence about one or you have a website and it's not so great, and you're probably wondering, how do I make money with this thing? I've listened. I get it. You want to know how to make money from your website. You want to know and ensure that this thing is going to pay for itself. You want to know that you are going to get a return on your investment whether that's the time that you put into it or the money or quite frankly, both. In today's episode, it's all about how to create a website that sells, one that actually makes you money so you can make money online. And while this is a topic that I can dive into on my own, I've brought on a special guest She's also my business bestie and friend for quite a while. She's now also your business bestie because she services women entrepreneurs. She's a business consultant. She co-founds a web design and SEO agency. She's a speaker, a funnels advocate, and the host of Geek on Fleet a podcast designed to help people make consistent income online. So welcome, April. Hey, Cassia. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. I'm so excited to have you. Like I know making money from your website is a big deal. Yes. And it's something I'm really excited to talk about with you because I see so many things that people aren't doing. You know, the usual build it and they'll come or I see so many people who have websites that you don't even know they have one so it's like if I don't even know you have a website what about your customer you know they have the website um, they're not talking about it they're not promoting it they're not marketing it and some just aren't built to make money That's so true. The number one reason why people come to me and my agency is because they already have a website and they're not making money. They don't understand. They probably paid like hundreds to thousands of dollars for it and they're just not seeing money come in. Like they, it just sits there on the internet and no one knows it exists, (laughs) (laughs) which happens to so many websites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So What would you say is the first thing after you have your website? What do you think are core components of making it make money for you? Like my first question is to ask you, what is a sales funnel? But before I get into that, you tell me as well as the audience the things that they need. So once you have a website, I would even say before it launches, What you need to do is to make sure that the copy or the text on your website is optimized to seduce things like Google and other search engines. So just having, (laughs) yes, that is how I say it. But so many people just think that you can throw any text 
on a website and that it's good enough. It's just yeah. anything to sell people. Yeah. But what really you need is you need to sell Google as well as humans. Right. So your, okay. your text needs to be optimized with certain keywords that are relative to your business and your area and your audience in mm -hmm. order to tell Google, hey, this person, they know what they're talking about. This is a great website. I should really show it to my search engine users. Right. People who are typing in things into Google. Mm -hmm. So you really need that. Um, I think also you probably need to um, work on a strategy of what you're going to do once somebody lands on your site. Yes. So things like once they land on my site, what is the most important thing that I'm selling or offering that someone should or I want them to buy? That should be Actually, front and center. You want to know what the goal is, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you want them to get there fast. Mm. So you don't want them to have to scroll down to like the third section of your homepage in order to see it. You want a pop-up to come up that says, hey, I have this freebie. Download it to get to your email list. You want the first thing at the top of your thing, uh, your site to say, hey, I have this new course or this new um, service out where I help yeah. people wash their own dog. Here, click here to go there. Mm -hmm. You want it to be front and center. And most people, the first thing they have on their website is a big old picture of them saying, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm okay. <laughs> Please I'm buy what? from me. I'm blah, blah, blah. I don't oh. know. <laughs> their name doesn't matter at that point. <laughs> Right. So this is what I like to call like your elevator pitch, which essentially mm -hmm. it is your elevator pitch. So when you first land on your website, you need to tell people who you are, what you do and what problem that you solve. So that people immediately know if I'm in the right place. Am I in the right site? Um, does this site have what I'm looking for? So it's usually your elevator pitch that should go there, that attention grabbing headline. You want people to be enticed, but also to understand that you're here to serve me and my unique problem. Mm. Most yeah. people use it as an ego booster to say all <laughs> the awesome things about them. But really, the people who are going to spend money on what you have, they don't care about you. They care about what you can do for them, how long it takes, mm -hmm. and what are the res specific results they're going to get from you. Very and how much point. Is. Yeah, yeah. Definitely how much it is as well as results because then once people know they're getting results or you're solving their problem, then the price isn't the main factor here. It's, it's a factor, but not the main thing. It's the last entry to barrier. It's the last barrier to entry. The uh -huh. last thing seem, someone is going to look at before they click add to cart mm -hmm. or before they click contact me is how much it's going to be. Very good point. Okay, so I really want to get into sales funnels. What is a sales funnel? Break it down. Okay, so a sales funnel is just a fancy marketing term for a specific <laughs> journey that you create to take a potential customer through mm -hmm. on the way to making a purchase. So right. how I like to explain it is think of like you're walking through a cosmetics aisle. And for you guys out there, just try to stay with me. Um, so the first thing you see is an eyeshadow palette that really, really attracts you. So you put it in your cart. The next thing you see when you walk down the aisle is a blush that matches the palette. And you're bougie like that, so you need to get that, of course. Mm. And the last thing you see before you leave the aisle is a $60 brush set that costs three times more than anything else you put in your cart. And you're like, well, yeah, how else am I going to put this stuff on my face? I need that brush set. That's a sales funnel. Taking you from a free or low cost offer to a high ticket item. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it can have many layers or it can have just two layers. Okay, okay. But walk us through it in an online sense in terms of taking someone from that freebie to actually making the sale. Because, you know, we understand what, well, you and I understand what is abandoned cart. Because you might just decide, 
hey, I don't think I want to buy these things. And you drop the cart in the aisle and you walk out the door. But we're in an online space. So chances of you just walking out the door is a little bit lower because you're already inside. But online, there's so many distractions. So you might X out of the site. You might walk away from your computer. So kind of want to talk about like the retargeting, all of that stuff, the email list. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure that you have all caught yourself in a sales funnel. Maybe you were on Instagram or Facebook and an ad popped up and it said, join my free webinar on how I built six figure business in six months. And they were wondering that, where did this come from? <laughs> exactly. But you're yeah. super intrigued. So you click on it and all you have to do is put in your name and your email address. So you're in there. And as soon as you enter your name and your email address, you're taken to a second page that says, hey, you want to learn how to make a six-figure business in six months? I have the exact blueprint for you. You can get it before the webinar. It's only $7 right now. There's no other distractions. It takes you from one of their pages to the second page, and you're already considering buying such a low-ticket item. So maybe you buy it, maybe you don't. Either way, they send you a couple emails before the webinar saying, hey, you know, this is the results my client got for six figures in six months, and this is the exact thing I'm going to teach you on my free webinar at 5 mm -hmm. p.m. tomorrow. So you show up for the webinar, and the webinar is all this beautiful words and how you <laughs> like to say, <laughs> feeding you fluff. And it's talking about all the results their clients have gotten going through this six-month program. And it's wonderful. And I know you're not making sales. You need this. You need this, girl. Or else you and wouldn't be here. Right? It's like talking straight to you. And at the very end, you have 15 minutes to sign up for their $2,000 course for only $197 today. And these extra bonuses. <laughs> And you get these extra bonuses. But if you don't do it in 15 minutes, the bonuses go away and you're back to $2,000. That is a sales funnel. You just got sucked in. Maybe it's super helpful. Maybe it's not. But I'm sure okay. we've all So I know my audience, a lot of them have retail businesses. Mm -hmm. Kind of paint an example of a sales funnel if you're a retail business. Because I know many people are subscribed to things like Amazon and Walmart, Target, and I kind of really want them to see how what the big brands do, they can apply to their own small business and like keep following up with clients, but in a passive way. Are we talking a brick and mortar retail business or an online business? Online business. Okay. So let's say you have an online e-commerce shop and you sell... We're just going to go with brushes. Brushes. Like hair brushes. Okay. Hair brushes and combs. So what you can do is you can start a series of ads about the different types of brushes that are better for growing a hair, that are better for getting fuller hair without having to buy all these products, mm. that are better for the different types of hair, like curly, straight, super damaged from dying, whatever. People download that freebie. They're automatically taken to your email list. And the right. email list talks about all of the different hairbrushes that you have. They maybe have a bunch of beautiful pictures in the emails. And the, all the emails at the very end or somewhere in them have, come see this exact brush if you have curly hair on my site today only. It is only $13. It's typically $29.99. Right. And then they click it, they go to your site, and they buy it. Very simple. And what happens if they don't buy? If they don't buy it, what you can do is, let's say they clicked and they went to your site. Right. And we'll do another one where they don't click. They click and go to your site. Maybe they put it in the cart. Maybe they didn't do anything else. What okay. you can do is in your Facebook ads, you can retarget those people. Say, girl, did you forget this hairbrush? Like, look mm. at this hairbrush. Look at this head of hair. Look at this beautiful curly hair waving in the wind or something. Like, right. you need this. Get this brush. Let's say they don't click. You have no way to track them 
um, to retarget on Facebook. But what you can do is you can go into your email marketing provider like MailChimp, MailerLite or whatever, and you can tell them, hey, everybody who didn't open this email or who didn't click this link, I want you to resend the email. I want you to send them this email saying, hey, I you know, you didn't open. Yesterday, yeah. yeah, I noticed you didn't open this. Hope you didn't forget this. Resending this or hey, maybe you don't have curly hair. Look at this. You can retarget them that way. Okay, I love that example of retargeting because people don't realize like they are in funnels every day, but they don't realize that they are. And they think it's a bit of a mystery, like, oh, I wonder how they're doing that, you know? And I, I love that we have this opportunity to demystify the process a bit for the listeners because these are things that we have access to also, not just the big brands. That's where, you know, having the Facebook pixel comes in so that you can retarget people via Facebook ads because you have to have this Facebook pixel installed. Um, I know what a Facebook pixel is, but um, briefly, you know, tell the audience what is a Facebook pixel so that they can retarget in that manner and why, well, you already told them why it's important. So if you um, want a Facebook pixel, all you need to do is you need to have a business page on Facebook and then you can go into your ads manager and ask for a Facebook pixel, which is just a little line of code and it tells you how to put it in your website. And it also says, hey, if you're not techie, but you have a web designer, give them these instructions and they can do this for you. And they'll send them yeah. instructions with your actual little line of code. You just pop it in your website really quick, save it, and you can start tracking people that Great. come to your website, that click on specific buttons, that maybe click on specific products or services that people who buy, people who don't buy. Facebook pixels can let you stock a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's essentially what I tell people. Um, I think that's a good piece of content right there. The stalker. <laughs> Internet but, stalking is totally okay yeah. in certain instances like a Facebook. For marketing, yeah. Yeah. So just to highlight that nugget, I hope you guys picked it up and you noticed it. If you are considering getting your website done, these are the things that you need to ask your prospective company, designer, or studio if you are asking them about pixel codes and any of these things and they will watch you with a blank face, they're not going to give you a website that sells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so those are some, some potential red flags. It may not be part of your initial package, but they should know how to do these things. And this is one of the things I always ensure to install on my client's site is the Facebook pixel. Because if at some point they are ready to implement a sales funnel as part of their strategy or as part of running Facebook ads, it's already there gathering data and stalking visitors. And let's say you don't think you're ready right now. Maybe you're just starting out in business or you just don't have the cash to run ads right now. If you have a Facebook pixel on your website, it's collecting data for however long you take until you're financially ready to run ads. Yeah. You don't have to do True. it tomorrow. Yeah. And that's why I installed the pixels so that whenever they're ready, it's already they're gathering all that data. Oh, Smart fun move. fact. Did you know that if you create content, you can retarget people who would have watched like five seconds, like either five to ten seconds of your video? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So viewers, you want to have the Facebook pixel on your website. And, and those you want to be creating kind of content. Yeah, those kind of ads that are retargeting people that have already been to your website, maybe they've never even seen you on Facebook, or that have already, say, like, watched a video on Facebook or interacted with your Facebook page at all, those ads have so much more conversion rate mm -hmm. than just by, like, a totally cold audience. And a cold audience means that they don't know you from Sam. <laughs> they don't know what you offer. They don't know yeah. how much it costs. They're like, who the hell is this person showing mm -hmm. up in my Facebook feed? Those kind of, oh, and promoted posts. Targeted posts or retargeted posts do so much better, better. than mm -hmm. promoting your content that the person didn't care about the first time. 
Yeah, that's that's so true. And I know people are so obsessed with um, follows and likes, but all of that effort into getting people to follow you or like on your post, you can reuse that data in your Facebook ads, target people yeah. who visited your page, etc. And how many people follow you matters a lot less than how many people pay you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole other conversation, but I absolutely agree. Okay, so my next question is, what are some ways to generate traffic to your website? I think that will lead us into the topic of SEO. Yeah, so there are tons of ways to take people to your website from different platforms. So there's always SEO, which means somebody lands on your site from Google and they click into your site. Mm -hmm. You can use Pinterest. So let's say you have some really pretty photos of your products or maybe your hairdresser. You have some beautiful like before and after photos. Mm -hmm. Those do really well on Pinterest, especially hair for people like me who can't do it. We want to see exactly how you did it, or we want to click on it, find out you're in our area, and then hire you to do our hair. Right. Another really. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I know like Pinterest, for those of you who don't know, that Pinterest is a search engine like Google, mm -hmm. but it's the visual search engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can do the same thing with YouTube, which is also a search engine. You can make videos or a channel on YouTube, and you can say, hey, guys. Want to sign up for more bonus content that I don't talk about on my YouTube channel? Sign up for my email address. You can take yeah. them straight to your website or maybe you're doing a video on your course or maybe you're doing a video on your service and like talking to a client doing like a case study right there on video and say, hey, do you guys want this for your business too? Go down into the description box and use it to go to my website and learn more about this. Um, mm -hmm. it's a great way to get people on there. You can use it on social media. So you can say, Hey guys, I have a brand new website or I'm launching this new service. If you are the type of person that likes this, 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 if you suck at this, 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 and this, you need this service. Go to my website right now, get on the wait list. And not only have you taken people to your website mm -hmm. that maybe would never have, thought to go to your website but they're on your email address and your yeah. email list i think what many people fail to do is that they are stuck on social media and what i mean by they're stuck on it is that even if they have the website and you know then they complain it doesn't make any money is that they're not telling people enough and or using social media enough to bring traffic to their site the just make the site live and that's it. Instead of launching the website and having like a launch strategy that builds up to the launch of the website, like the goal is to get people to your site and get them on your mailing list. Mm -hmm. Because after people visit your site, what happens then? You know, you want to reconnect with them. And one of the things that I am absolutely fascinated by when it comes to your email list is how much it really helps to convert sales because the same because this is another misconception that i want to share as a personal story the same people who are on your mailing list might be following you on social media and i have seen for myself that many people have told me i didn't know about x until i saw your email mm -hmm. because we're fighting the algorithm you know, we complain and we moan and we like, oh, they changed the algorithm again. And it's like, you don't have to worry about the algorithm if you have your email list. And did you email, see that story I did about, hey, are you guys freaking out over this? This <laughs> bug that Instagram had where you're losing like 500 of your contacts. Guess what? I didn't even know about it because I don't get clients by like going on my social media all day and night. I have SEO. Thank you. I need to get it too. <laughs> It was a very sad story. I didn't story. see it. I didn't see oh it. Oh, my God. Yes. I should have put it in my highlights. Put it in your highlights so I can go check it I out. Will. Yeah. 
So it's very true though. People are very reliant on getting money from social media organically and they have to work so hard to fight the algorithm to and that's stressed people, out. <laughs> yeah, to take people from a post to buying mm. when they could literally be sitting back having funnels running, having SEO get people from Google to their site, having automated Pinterest posts from Tailwind that drag people from Pinterest over. They focus so much on the hard work that they forget that you can do it an easier way. Listen, here's another testimony. I follow this particular page and because I interact, their posts are one of the first posts to pop up mm -hmm. when I log into Instagram. Yet that never made me buy. Like I enjoy their posts and I will save it, but it doesn't inspire me to buy. And I realized again, the power of the email list because I bought something from them and it didn't, it wasn't because I follow them on Instagram. It's because I got an email of theirs and they were offering something that resonated with me. It spoke to me and it was exactly what I was looking for. No, you know. no kidding you because I watched one of the, the things that I purchased and I was like, oh my gosh, this is right on time. And that just goes to prove that the, something about the email is that one-on-one -on -one email in your inbox, even though you mentally know that this is mass distributed and it's not sent directly to me, there's something sacred about your email inbox that's like no, that's like no social media. Social media, one, it's noisy. Um, two, it's very distracting because I'll see that, I'll enjoy it, I'll share it, and then I move on. Well, it's kind of like, so I'm a vegan and I like Oreos, they're vegan. I liked the Oreo page on Facebook because I like vegans, right? right? And then all these posts about Oreos and milk and cookies started coming up in my feed and I could care less, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes nothing to like a page and start seeing it on Facebook. It takes actual effort and permission mm -hmm. to get somebody on your email list and to get them to have loyalty towards you and continue to open your emails and then yeah. to hit buy. So just like That's you, true. I was on this one girl's email list for probably like three months before, and I loved her content before she actually had like a paid thing in there. And it was just a little 19 page ebook about how she did something. And I'm so nerdy. I was like, I must know how she did that. I bought it. It was just $19. It was a very small purchase. Mm -hmm. But I liked it so much. The content was so good that when her course came out, I bought her course. Yeah. I so. feel like it's something about that. It just feels a lot more intimate, that email, and you're sitting there in your inbox reading it. It feels more like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And we do like that aspect of that one-on-one -on -one attention. Yep. Yeah. And there's no, there's no distraction, like you said, for scrolling. Mm -hmm. It takes nothing to double tap on something on Instagram or to click like on Facebook on a Facebook post. It takes effort to open an email. True. That's so true. And then you're not competing with, are they going to scroll right past my thing once they like it? Are they even reading what I have to say or just looking at my picture? There's none of that. They're reading your email. So true. Very good point. So there's power in the email inbox. Mm -hmm. So you know how they say um, it goes down in the DMs, it goes down in the email inbox as well. So yes. If, if you are frustrated that, hey, I'm getting all these likes, but I'm not getting sales, it really goes back to April's point where it takes nothing to get likes, you know, to tap like, but it takes a lot more effort to, well, we know engagement is a higher um, thing and uh, yeah okay so what are some SEO tips and tricks okay so the first thing I would tell people to do is to make sure that your website loads quickly a lot of people keep blocking their website down with very large pictures 
or with so much stuff that it just takes forever to load and you only have like three to five seconds to get someone's attention before they bounce off your site. So if your site doesn't load quickly, they're not even going to look at the rest of your page, let alone buy something from you. Listen, I need to touch on that. I need to interject and probably <laughs> rant a little bit because... Do it. <laughs> this is a little shade to Wix. This is why I'll show a little shade to Wix because Wix has too much going on when it comes to things like that. Shiny buttons, drop shadows. It's too much. But aside from Wix, um, part of the discussion on my Facebook page, on websites and what's holding me back is one person said they're waiting to have it just perfect you know they wanted to have it bells and whistles but does bells and whistles sell sites you don't need to have these quote-unquote bells and whistles whatever they may be like you know animated text is actually a bad thing like your website should not be jumping doing cartwheels and spinning around and doing all these fancy things because that does nothing to your bottom line in this yeah. case i'd say less is definitely more what are your thoughts I completely agree. <laughs> you you know, because we've talked, I think pretty websites are the most useless piece of junk on the internet. Pretty websites oftentimes are not converting. They look really nice. You're really proud to show it off to your family and friends. And of course, your family and friends are going to say, ooh, ah, it's beautiful. <laughs> but the thing is, they don't take you through a journey to click anything mm -hmm. you know you're not buying from them you're distracted because there's so much crap going around maybe things are spinning maybe they're just using pictures <laughs> that are really busy pictures are sliding <laughs> pictures are sliding i hate that <laughs> that also slows down your site or they just like they're just it's such a, a like a temple to themselves they're, you know, there's just such pretty things. They're so proud of it. It's like an engagement ring. It's huge. It's gorgeous. There's like all sorts of different things going on. But does that pretty website have the ability to sell? Usually no. Now, there are pretty websites that sell well, mm. but they're not usually what people would consider like the pretty websites, like the Jenna Kutcher websites. Oh, Okay. So let me just interject and clarify. When we say pretty websites, we don't mean that they aren't, um, you can't have a site that's strategically built, optimized for sales, and be aesthetically pleasing. You can have oh, a balance yeah. of all, and visuals are important. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the websites that are just doing way too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's too much fancy stuff. Too much animation going on, too much movement. Like, no matter how pretty a site is, let's be real. If the site isn't loading, worse yet, if you're on a mobile device and the site isn't loading, you're going to get frustrated and be like, I don't have time for this, and you X out. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the reality of it. It is. And there are statistics to back that up. So if you are like, oh, no, my site loads so fast. There are websites out there. They're free to use. You just pop in your website and it will tell you how slow or how fast your website is. And if yours is not in the three to second range or if your images are too many megabytes, many yes, I would say three to five seconds typically. Now, the statistic is three to eight seconds, but I have never known anybody to wait eight seconds. Eight seconds is a very long time. So true. Mm -hmm. Like if you stop there and you count, to eight Mississippis, mm. you're gonna be real bored by the time you reach eight. Yeah, we uh, it, and I mean we all all already know that our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter in the in this digital age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Uh, another so thing that I would say tricks. people. Yeah, another thing that I would say people need mm -hmm. is to make sure that every single image on their website has a keyword rich alt tag and file name. So if you guys have ever gone on to Google, you will so know I'm, that. I'm not sure if you're going to expand on what that means, but I was going to interject to ask, what does that mean for those who don't know what that is? So an alt tag is like you have two things. You have what you named your photo when you saved it, 
before you put it on your website. And then once you put it in your website, you have this thing called an alt tag, which is just alternative text. Mm -hmm. So let's say your photo doesn't load on somebody's device. This text is going to be in the blank spot where your photo should be. Let's say okay. that you are looking at a, or you have a blind person looking at your site or a colorblind person and they can't see it. They have special devices that will read out or spell out what is on the picture. Oh. And, mm -hmm. and if you're looking at Google in your search results, you're going to see like a web result and an image result. Your images can independently rank on Google without your website ranking. So that gives you multiple chances to show up to people. And it's that alt tag that gets you there. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. Yep. Okay. And let's see. The last tip I would say. Um, okay, so the third tip I'd give people is to stop thinking like the industry expert that you are when you are writing the copy and looking for search terms or keywords to put on your website. Because most of your customers don't use terms like you do. So words like Boca, if you're a photographer, most people aren't searching for that. So yeah, they're searching no for... Is. <laughs> Boca is the blurry background in pictures. Ah. Right? So most okay. people don't know about it. I had known about it for years, didn't know about it for years, and I have photographer clients. So mm -hmm. if you're a photographer, just for an example, people don't know what that word is. So don't use the word bokeh all over your website as a keyword because no one's going to find your website. People are searching for blurry background photo. Right. You know? mm -hmm. So those fancy terms or those industry terms, like even the term SEO, people don't necessarily search for that because they don't know what that is. They know what get on Google means, get on page one of Google. Mm -hmm. So if I was like trying to attract customers that have no idea what SEO is, but they want that result, I would use how to get on page one of Google as a search keyword phrase. Right. So most people are just using them wrong. Okay. That's good. So any final things you want to leave with the audience in terms of how they can ensure they get a return on investment on their website? Yes. So ROI or return on investment is really easy to trace with websites. If you want to ensure that you make back what you spent on your website, you need things like search engine optimization or um, you need things like making sure your website isn't all about you, mm. you know, making sure that it's tailored to what the problem your ideal customer has and how you solve it, how long it takes, how much it is, what transformation they can expect. Yeah. Where even before you approve a design and you have a website, maybe ask your ideal client, not your best friend or family, to run through your website with you on a recorded call or to fill out a survey that goes page by page in exchange for a $15 Starbucks card or mm -hmm. Walmart card because your friends and your family love you. They will love anything you do and say it's great, but it doesn't mean it's going to make you money. So if you get a completely objective person who's your ideal client to look through their, your site, you might find things that need to be changed mm -hmm. before you launch your website. You might find things that are very appealing to them or they might give you notes back that say, hey, I don't think I could afford a $5,000 pair of glasses. I can afford like a 500 pair of glasses. So maybe the first thing on your website to your ideal client needs to be a $500 pair of glasses. Very good point. I love that example because it really displays how you can maximize that first page on mm -hmm. your website. I mean, people can come through on your site on any page, but if you have like a start here button, um, that's even a little strategy tip. You can really guide people through the process that you want them to take to ultimately get the website to do what you want it to do. So I really like that tip. 
And it's kind of like what I did with you. So I put all of the copy and the information for my new um, service and my new membership coming up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, what do you think of this? And the feedback you gave was so good. Mm-hmm. Like I will make changes and I will talk more about certain things because right. of the feedback that you gave. Most people don't do that. And most web right. designers, it's not their job to make sure that you ask your ideal client. Mm-hmm. So if yeah. it's not their job while you're in the approval stage, it's your job to make sure that you give it to other people to look at. Yeah, that's another nugget I wanted to highlight is the fact that oftentimes we may ask, but we're not asking the right people. And we may just hop on Instagram, Facebook, a Facebook group, and just open it up for the world when we should carefully curate who we ask um, who we survey and who we poll because you may you will get tons of feedback, but is it helpful feedback? Is it appropriate feedback? Probably not because they're not your target market. Kind of very similar to when people want to advertise anywhere. And another nugget that you touched on, which I think is a really good point, is that at least with a website, you can really track how it's performing versus other things like a billboard, flyers, business cards, banners, like many people just spend tons of money on those things, but they're on the fence on a website that they can't see what's working, what's not working, so they can tweak. And they have all these fancy printed stuff that just, it's just loud, but it doesn't really do anything. How do you know that you're getting business from that banner? How do you know you're getting business from that flyer? Well, unless, you know, customers come to you and you survey them and you ask them, where did you come from? I've never bought anything from a business card somebody gave me. (laughs) So if you're looking for something to directly get sales and start getting sales quickly, business cards and printed flyers or trifolds, they're not the way to go anymore. Yeah, those things are definitely... Becoming outdated in this digital world, um, they have a time and place on when it's like carefully thought out. So I know like if you are sponsoring a particular event, you might put your business cards or flyers in there so people know about you and they'll follow you on um, social media, you know, and then you can follow up from there to show them your freebie and get them on your list. But those prints and material doesn't really have any um, continuity to it. Like what happens after, let's say they throw it away. And let's be honest, many people throw away business cards. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Most of the time I don't accept business cards because I don't have room in my purse for them. And I just don't care to have them. But I I will follow somebody online. I know people collect them because they think it's polite. (laughs) Oh, I'm not that polite. (laughs) I tell people, you know what? I don't actually accept business cards, but do you have a website? Do you have an Instagram account? I can go follow you really quick. You know, I'm just going to do that for the sake of experiment. Just amuse myself and see how people respond. Because lately I have been exercising my not so polite self. I've noticed I've made a greater effort when I'm out and about doing errands and people are trying to hand me flyers and I just tell them no and keep walking or I don't make eye contact and I keep walking (laughs) but usually before I used to feel like the social pressure to be like just take the flyer you know you're going to throw it away just take it and throw it away um, at the nearest bin but now I'm like no I don't want it leave me alone (laughs) it's not just that but if you accept those things and you have every intention to throw it away or never use it, you're costing them money. That's how I think about it. You purchased this. It cost you money. I'm never going to look at it again. I'm just going to throw it out. So I'm saving Mm. you money. You can save your little piece of paper. Well, they might be offended. Like she wouldn't take it. People won't take it. You know? People are a lot less less offended if you say, you know what? I don't actually, you know, accept business cards from anybody. But what is your Instagram handle? Because I'll go on right now without my phone. 
Uh, I'm going to go follow you. And then you followed up with a DM. That was actually a post I made this week. I don't know if you saw it. Mm -mm. Yeah. Oh, the business card thing? Yeah. The business card and following people instead as an alternate. Uh, I saw that, but I I didn't see any of the comments. Oh, yeah. It it was a hot post, apparently. (laughs) I was not expecting people to be so passionate about business cards, but apparently it's a, a real struggle out here. I was proud of you. I was. I do the same thing. I don't accept business cards. I even say it in every single one of my presentations about SEO. So I equate them to just if you have if you're a woman, you only have so much room in your purse mm. and you don't want to waste it and make it heavy collecting business cards. And if you're a man, you only have so much room in your wallet. You don't have room for everyone's business card. Stop accepting them. Start creating connections in different ways. Beautiful. Thank you so much, April. I think there's tons of value in this podcast today. I think people may have to re-listen and take some notes because they're probably knocked out by so much things to process. How should people find you and connect with you? And anything else you think they need to know? I am online everywhere at aprilbrown.co. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and that's my website. So if you'd like to follow me, I would love to connect with you. And if you're interested in more business type podcasts, you can go on iTunes and find me on Geek on Fleek. Awesome. Thank you so much again, April. It was a pleasure. Yay. All right, guys. Take care. Until the next one. Bye, Bye. guys.